13. That's where we'll be at tonight in our sermon. Matthew chapter 13. And what we're going to be looking at is our theme about the kingdom of God. And I think it's very important when we're talking about God, the kingdom of God. We talked about the past couple of weeks talking about this basic Bible doctrine because it's so important to talk about because there's so many false ideas about God's kingdom today. And then we talked about a couple of weeks ago of letting God be the ruler of our heart, our mind and that we are to reason correctly. And so this week, let's look at God's parables. Let's look at what Jesus says about the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we're going to see in Matthew 13. So what we're going to do is the two main points I just want to do is analyze the parable. And then secondly, we're going to, of course, apply the parable to our lives. And we're going to look at six parables. Now, four of these are very short. uh, And I think that they're very important. The first one, of course, is parables about worth, about value. Second one we're going to look at is, of course, the king of heaven grows. There's growth. And then the third one we want to look at separation and judgment. So let's look at the parables of value and worth. This one's called the one of hidden treasure. So if you'll be back, going back to verse 44, Matthew 13, 44. Uh, again, the king of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. I want you to analyze this and think about four things with me. First thing to think about is, notice that there's an abundance. Think about this. There's this treasure. And this treasure, when we think about treasure, I mean, we think about finding gold coins or finding something of very much, uh, that's of worth, of value. And this guy, he, found, he finds it and he, just, he realizes what he has and he goes up and, buy, and he buys that field because he knows what he's found. Well, that's the thing about we think about abundance. Secondly, notice he wasn't searching for it. He stumbles upon it. It's an accident. So notice he wasn't even searching for this treasure. Thirdly, look at when he finds it. What kind of attitude does he have? An attitude of joy. So it's overflowing with happiness. And that's something that we need to think about with our lives. And then the fourth thing, of course, is the arrangement he makes. Think about the lengths that he went, the sacrifice he made in order to buy that field. He sold all that he had. Now, when you apply this parable to us, think about the abundance this way. The spiritual blessings, all of them are found in Christ. Every single one. All spiritual blessings... Every, every single uh, rich, uh, rich thing is what matters most is found in Jesus Christ. And that's something that if you're a Christian, you have that access to that treasure. And Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 talks about all the spiritual blessings in Christ. I mean, you can just mention all the things about election, about pre- uh, predestination, about redemption, about, I mean, you name it. There's all sorts of things. But I just want to mention one to you. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. Jesus bought us back. He purchased us with His own blood. And, he, and what does His blood cost us? It gave us, it cleanses us of our sins, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. And then you go to Colossians 2, verse 3. It says, in whom? In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So I want you to think about the abundance, the treasure that Christ really is, and be glad, take hold of it, never let go of it. Always keep that in your heart. Number two, look at the accident again. Remember, this man stumbled upon this treasure. Well, sometimes people, by accident, they come upon the the gospel truth. And I want you to see that how, how this occurred in the Bible. Number one, we see it in Acts 2. Remember the Jews? It was their normal routine every year. The Jewish males would go to this feast called Pentecost, right? And so it was just like any other Pentecost. Hey, we're going up. We're going to do what God commands. We're coming to Jerusalem. We're going to celebrate this feast. Well, this Pentecost, day of Pentecost was not like any other. 
when we see the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and they spoke in languages they never studied. So people were just really excited. And they're like, wow, what's going on here? And they realized they had crucified Christ. And so they obeyed the gospel. So it was in a sense by accident they came upon re- hearing Peter's sermon. Number two, I think another example is the Samaritan woman. You go to John 4. Uh, this woman, she goes up to the well uh, at noontime, j- just doing her do- normal routine, right? And then Jesus is waiting there, and he talks about this water, this living water. And, of course, the woman, she wants this type of water. And, of course, he is able to convince her that he is ultimately the Messiah. And then, the, of course, the third one example is, of course, when you think about, um, when you think about Nathaniel. So Nathaniel, you remember, he was kind of the guy who, unfortunately, was kind of pessimistic, you know. He's like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, Jesus came out of Nazareth. He, there's something good that did, and Jesus is it. And he said, Jesus said to him, I saw you under the fig tree. And, I mean, Nathaniel realized, how could he have known that? And he said, you are the king of Israel. And, of course, Nathaniel's probably Bartholomew, which is one of the twelve apostles. So, like we see here, people can come and stumble upon the truth. So, Proverbs 23, 23, I think, really bears out in mind. Buy the truth, do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. So, always hold the truth. Number three, uh, remember this guy, he has a great attitude of joy. He's just over, he's just so excited. He knows what he immediately must do. He must go and sell all he has so he can buy that field. Well, why did he joyfully sell all that he had? Think about that. I mean, could you, could you sell everything that you had to buy a field? Well, this guy did because he realized what he had. And that's what God's kingdom, God's reign, it transforms your life. It, it gives you something that you never thought about before, that you have purpose, that you have value, that there is something that we are now have that mission of transforming this world. Another thing to think about is, sadly, there are so many people, when they hear the gospel message, what do they do? Well, unfortunately, they make excuses. They think, oh, you know what, I have to go to work or... I have to get married, and therefore I cannot come to you this invitation of the Lord's banquet. That's what happened in Luke 14. People just making excuses. Or sometimes people procrastinate. People just say, oh, you know what, I'll obey the gospel someday, like Felix did in Acts chapter 24. Or, unfortunately, some just don't love the truth, and therefore they are led by a lie. So it's very important that we think about our attitude. The Bible says that we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then, of course, the arrangement he made. Notice his sacrifice, but he quickly does it. He does this in haste. He doesn't wait. He quickly gets it done. And that's what we need to think about with our lives when we talk about discipleship. Discipleship is going to cost us something. It's going to cost us sacrifice. But it's the, it's the best thing we could ever do. Um, you know, I just think about such of these questions like here. Why do some not of us not come to worship on the first day of the week when that's what God commands of us? Is it because we don't love God? We don't love God enough to come and worship Him and give Him the glory? Just think about why we ought to come to stir up love and good works. That's part of the reason why we are to assemble together is to encourage one another. Secondly, why do some not read and study their Bibles? Is it because, unfortunately, they don't love the author enough who gave us his word? We should be more like the psalmist who really loves God's word and we hide it in our heart that we may not sin against him. Number three, why do some of us not put spiritual things above other things? Well, it's because we don't love God enough. Or number four, why do we not live out what God commands, as we find in James 2? See, you have to think about discipleship. Discipleship means sacrifice. It means giving your life totally to God, giving everything that you have. 
Well, we look at the second parable, which is very similar to the first, but there are a few differences. So let's read it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So notice the difference between this parable and the other parable. The other parable, he stumbled upon the truth. This one, this guy was on a quest. He was actually pursuing, I mean, this guy, he... His everyday living was finding special things, finding pearls. And so he was looking for something very special. And, of course, he found it. He found the pearl of great price. And, of course, what does he do? He notices that this thing is more valuable than anything else. And so he gets his priorities straight. He goes and sacrifices everything that he has, and he quickly buys it. Now, uh, one of the things I did as a child... Uh, when I was a teenager, my dad and I loved to go uh, arrowhead hunting. Uh, where I lived, there was once Indians who lived there, and of course they, they hunted with arrowheads. And arrowheads are actually worth some money. You can go and sell them to these ancient uh, these museums. Uh, my dad has over probably 5,000 arrowheads that we found over a period of, I don't know, 20 years. And so, you know, it's just really amazing when you're walking along, when somebody has uh, pulled up that ground, and you're looking, and you're looking, and my dad, he had a better eye than I did, but every time he would see one, man, you pick it up, wow, it's so special, you found it. Well, I think finding pearls is, of course, more important than arrowheads, they're definitely worth a lot more, but, you know, think about how this applies to us today. Don't, think about God's pursuit of us. He's the one who rescues the creation first. He's the one that put forth the effort. Even before we loved him, he set out to love us. That's why 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. But secondly, because God pursues us, then in return, we develop that love for God. So Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you seek God with all your heart. And so we ought to pursue God. We ought to be like the Bereans. Man, those Bereans, what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily. They wanted to make sure what they were studying was what Paul was, Paul was teaching the truth. Nicodemus, John 3, I mean, he came to Jesus by night. Uh, Rabbi, we know you can do these signs. but And we know that only a true messenger of God can do these signs. And of course, I believe that Nicodemus was looking for the kingdom of God through the Messiah. And so he sought that. So how much do we put forth that kind of effort? Do we really show this kind of pursuit in, of spiritual things? We already read Proverbs 23. We're to buy the truth. Sell it not, because it's so valuable, so precious. Don't let go of it. But secondly, uh, I want to apply this to neglected books of the Bible. You know, when it comes to the Lord's Church, uh, unfortunately, when I was growing up, the books that you normally study are, of course, the Gospels and Acts. But nobody wanted to study books like Song of Solomon, or nobody wanted to study Isaiah, nobody wanted to study Ezekiel, nobody wants to study, you know, the hard books, or Revelation, of course. But Every book of the Bible is important. And when you start to study these neglected books, you find out, wow, I see how God's, God's way of doing things connects to everything that he does. And it's, so it's, it's worth putting forth that effort. Another reason I talk about this is because we're to defend our faith. We're to give an answer to the reason of the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. And if we're not ready to help people who don't believe in God, then we are failing in our commission. We're failing to be what God calls us to be, that we're to help people show them the reason for the hope that's in us. And so it's very important that we pursue truth. Number two, look at the pearl of great price. Now, we've been studying Ecclesiastes, and of course, you know, Solomon, he goes through searching for wisdom, for riches, for all these different things pearls and these are all important it's important to have an education you know it's important but 
spiritual things are much more important. And that's what this merchant found. He says, this is the pearl I've been searching for, unlike all these other pearls. They don't ultimately satisfy. And then number three, he gets his priorities right. And we should follow the merchant example. What does he quickly do? He sacrifices everything he has, and he goes and he buys that field. Well, I want you to remember this. Cost grows out of faith. And the greater our faith is, the greater the cost will be. And I want you to apply this to the Apostle Paul. I mean, look at what Paul had, and yet look what he gave up in order to become a Christian. Philippians 3, 7 through 11 says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Well, that leads us to our next set of parables. So we looked at these parables of, you know, it's so very important when you think about the value and importance of God's kingdom, God's reign in our lives. Well, think about it with the growth now. So we look at the mustard seed and the leaven. So the Bible says, if you want to read along with me, you have to turn back a few verses. Uh, we're in ver- Matthew 13, 31. Matthew 13, 31. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The king of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sold in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So notice first he talks about the seed, how small it is, how insignificant, how insignificant at first glance it seems. But second, look at how significant it grows, how big it becomes. Now, I don't know if y'all can see that, but there's a little mustard seed. Pretty small, right? Very small. And then you go a little bit bigger, look how it grows. First, there's the mustard plant. And then some some get to the tr- tree this size. And I know that this is a picture I took when I was in Palestine. And unfortunately, it's by some trash. But uh, as you can see, they don't grow too tall. But it's amazing how grow, how much growth they do, do get. But think about this in relationship to Christ's kingdom. So think about Christ from a human point of view. Uh, try not to look at it from a, a divine perspective. I mean, from a, from a human point of view, I mean, Christ, he was born in Bethlehem. That's not anything special. I mean, yeah, David, the king, was born there. But then, you know, where did he grow up? He grew up in that despised town of Nazareth. And you have to think about, wow, Jesus was born in a manger, a place where animals come in and eat from. Wow, that's not really special, is it? It's not a palace or anything. And then who does Jesus gather? Does he gather all the educational elite, all the wealthy people in the world to be his disciples? No, he just gets ordinary fishermen, this tax collector. I mean, these people aren't in the high elite class. They were people who weren't trained in schools. But then, notice the significant growth. Notice how, I mean, Christ's kingdom just takes off. It's amazing how strong it grows. And you can look in the references in Acts chapter 4, verse 4. It just says, the numbers of disciples grew, multiplied. The numbers of the priests obeyed the gospel, and they grow, and it grows. So what can we learn from this? Don't despise small things. That's what Zechariah is all about. I mean, when they rebuilt the temple, don't despise it. God has come back to help you and to help his people grow the church. And then, of course, just think about how God's power is able to break down every barrier, whether it be social, whether it be educational, whether it be gender. I mean, God is wanting all to be saved. God does not restrict anyone from coming to him. And then three, of course, is that the Old Testament prophets, what they said that the, God's kingdom would grow and it would grow strong is fulfilled. 
I like what an author wrote about Jesus, and I think it's worth reading. He says, Here is a man who was born in an obscure, obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He, na- he was nailed upon a cross between two robbers. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty long centuries have come and gone, and today he's a centerpiece of the human race and leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever were built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as had that one solitary life. Indeed, Jesus is the most powerful force in the world, isn't he? Well, the next, uh, of course, parable that Jesus gives is the leaven. So look at Matthew 13, 33. In another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was leavened. So when you think about leaven, uh, usually in the Bible, leaven is viewed negatively. But in this case, it's viewed in a positive way. So, you, you know, when you think about a woman baking this, uh, making this meal, it's something that's silent. It's something that's invisible, but it grows. And it's hard to see it happen. And it's so significant. And I think we can think about how leaven can be uh, applied to our lives today. Not, not in a negative way, but in a positive way. First, think about leaven in that it is working inwardly and invisibly. Think about how the gospel has changed you and I. It changes us inwardly. It, I mean, we're, yes, we, are, we repented of our sins. We believed on Christ. We are immersed in water for the remission of our sins. So Christ has forgiven us. And then we walk in newness of life. And therefore we start our journey. And we begin that journey. And as we walk with Christ, we are changing. We're being more transformed. So it works inwardly and invisibly. Secondly, it works gradually. You know, when you go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it talks about developing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, all of those. You know, that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And so leaven works gradually. Thirdly, it works quietly. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 talks about how the Word of God works effectively in those who believe. And so think about how God's, when we're studying God's Word in just a quiet place, it can inwardly change you. Leaven works quickly in warmer dough. Think about that. It t- uh, and that's what, what the kind of heart we need, a warm heart, a receptive heart. And that's what Jesus says. If you are that good soil, then you will produce the kind of fruit that God will enjoy. And then number five, leaven can't help but multiply. You can't help but go in and getting in contact with other people and tell them about the good news about Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And that's what the people did. They went everywhere preaching the word. And then, of course, as he made contact, and I think about the example of Philip, he went and taught the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch, he probably, when he was in Ethiopia, he taught others the gospel. So that's the way that it should be in our lives. Our last point is looking at the parables of separation and judgment. Notice how along the way we've seen how it, it is the case that how these parables have a time element. So first, you know, you, in, your, in your daily walk, you either stumble upon the truth or you're, you're seeking it and you find it and you become a Christian. And then, of course, there's that period of growth, you know, throughout your life. But then there's going to be a time when God is going to judge this world on the last day. 
And we do not know when that day will be. So he's talking about the wheat and the tares. So Matthew 20, 13, 24 through 30, the Bible says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to, then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So when you analyze this, and I'm showing you that Jesus, he, the disciples were wanting to know, Lord, please explain this parable to us. And Jesus does. He says, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. And of course, uh, you can gather what he's talking about later. So how can we apply the parable? Well, we apply the parable in this way. God has always sought us in, intentionally for our good. God, in the beginning of creation, wanted man to follow him and to love him and to grow into fellowship with him in the Garden of Eden. But unfortunately, as Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, man sought out many schemes. Man was made upright. He was created upright. But they sought out many schemes, and unfortunately they fell. And Adam and all of us have, fall, have followed sin, unfortunately. Well, we see that he who sows good seed is the Son of Man. So Jesus has come to restore that relationship. And he wants to sow the good seed and produce in us what should have been from the beginning. Number two, now, don't, don't lose sight of this. The field is the world. Now, that's very important. The world is all people. Now, when we understand God's kingdom, I know a lot of us think kingdom is equals church. But I need you to recognize something. Uh, and I put it this way. It, that's a yes and no. And I put it this way. The church is the manifestation of God's rule on earth. It is us who have submitted to God's will that we want His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven that we see, that people can see God ruling in our lives. You remember in Luke chapter 19, we're not going to go through all of this, but in Luke 19, Jesus gave this parable, and he talks about these enemies who did not want the, the, the Son of Man to reign over them. To reign over them. And at the very end, look what it says. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. You see, whether we think so or not, Christ is ruler over this whole universe. But the choice is up to you and I to submit to him. But we are under his law. You see, there's sadly been some false doctrine being taught among us. And I want to correct this false teaching. You see, God's New Testament law is for all people. You're amenable whether you know it or not. And it's very important that you recognize that the Christian will accept it but the non-Christian will reject it. Now, let's apply this to the marriage, divorce, remarriage. You see, some people are teaching, well, you know, God's rule on marriage is that it's only for the Christian. It's not for the non-Christian. So if the non-Christian, if he keeps on, you know, getting in these adulterous marriages, and let's say he wants to become a Christian... You know, he doesn't have to put away that adulterous marriage. He's okay. He wasn't under God's law. Well, friend, that's not true. He is under God's law. All men are under God's law. This is the truth of the matter. You are, everyone is under God's law for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. In fact, Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning of creation. 
Was there, was there any distinction between crea- uh, Christians and non-Christians from creation? No. It was over all human beings. So, let's keep going. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. So, those who have truly converted, they've obeyed the gospel. So, that's what Jesus is saying there. Uh, Romans six seventeen. You obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which you have obeyed. Then it's, the tares are the sons of the wicked one. And here's the thing. Unfortunately, there are people who are in the church and even outside of the church who sadly will remain in their, in their wicked state. They go back to living a wicked life. And they were never really truly converted. Now, I want to talk about this because I think this is very important. You know, when he talks about the wheat and the tares, the reason he talks about wheat and tares is because wheat and tares look so similar and if you think about it, we all, as human beings, we look similar. And so let me give you some examples of what I think Jesus is saying here. Number one, it could be a person who obeys the gospel because, oh, it's going to get his wife to stop nagging. Well, this person's not really truly converted. He's just wanting to stop his wife from complaining about him. Two, a person who's married wrong, living in adultery, and declares he's, he's doing right when he obeys the gospel. Well, that's not true either. Baptism does not wash away unrepenting sins. Number three, a person, young person comes forward and you know, he wants to get baptized because all of his friends are doing it. Well, that's not for the right reason. Number four, a person becomes a member of the church because his parents are the members of the church. Well, you need to have your own personal faith. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And then he says, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Well, like we see, Satan is able to sow seed among those who are in the church and outside the church. That's why we've got to watch out for the devil, because he's, he's like a lion who is seeking to devour us. Never, look at the next thing. The harvest is the end of the age. So at some point in time, there's going to be this last day where God is going to gather the wheat. He's going to pluck up the righteous... And he's going to bring those into the barn. But those who are the tares, he's going to gather them up and he's going to burn them. Well, what does that mean? It's talking about hell. Hell is a sad reality to those who have not obeyed the gospel. You know, that's why this teaches us that God allows both evil to be in Christ's kingdom. Because Christ rules over the whole world. Evil exists. Evil exists, unfortunately, among us, as we see. Number seven, uh, some people have said, well, okay, so this verse is going against church discipline, isn't it? No. You see, the fact of the matter is, there are some people, like in 1 Corinthians 5, who are living with their stepmother in adultery, and you know that's a public sin, it's an evident sin, it's manifested, you can know it. And so that person, in love, we try to help that person to come out of that sin. But there are some people who are living in sin secretly. You know, they may be living in, uh, they may have a covetous heart. They may be a hypocrite. We, We can't know. We cannot judge motives of people's hearts. You just can't know. And so that's why on the day of judgment, God's going to look at everyone's hearts. He's going to know who is those who are righteous and those who are evil. And so we must make we must see that as well. And the reapers are the angels. So of course God will use the angels to separate the evil and the righteous. And unfortunately the wicked will go to hell. Now there are those among us who are saying, well, you know, when you go to hell, uh, you know, it's a place where boom, you're just gone. You're zapped. Well, Hell in the Bible is talked about in some very horrific terms. So the Bible teaches this conscious, eternal punishment, and we need to recognize that. Well, then we go to the next parable, and the next parable is just very similar to the last one, so we won't go into much detail. But notice it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing 
and gnashing of teeth. Here's a picture of a dragnet. I mean, imagine taking that dragnet. You're going to get every fish, whether it be good or bad. So when all those fishes come to the shore, all right, this one's a good fish. We're going to keep it. This one's a bad fish. Throw it away. Just throw it on the sand of the seashore. Let it die. So that's something that we need to think about here. So how can we apply this parable? Number one, many come into God's kingdom with less than full devotion. They're not willing to sacrifice. This is related to the two soils of the parable of the sower. You know, there's the wayside, stony ground, the weeds, and the good soil. Well, there are those who become Christians, but then quickly fall away. They turn away from God. They just don't develop a strong foundation. And then there are those who have become the thorns choke out their life because they allow the cares of this world to carry them away. And so that's something we need to talk with we need to think about here. Number two, this is not addressing those who get momentarily sin and who constantly repent and change their hearts to be more faithful. You know, Galatians six verse one talks about us. Walking in the light as he is in the light. Number three, this is just talking about people who keep on living in the world and who won't change after they come into God's kingdom. Well, number four and five, what should you do with people who are living worldly? Well, you, we need, need to church discipline them to those who are that manifestly you can see it, but to those you cannot see. Those who have hidden it, well, we'll let God be the judge of that. So in conclusion, I just want to ask these two questions in the lesson will be yours. Have you come into God's kingdom with a fully devoted heart, loving God, seeking His will? Or are you the type of disciple that Jesus is talking about? Are you the bad fish that God's going to remove? Are you the person who is actually the tares? Uh, you need to really think about what kind of person you really are. And I hope that you want to be transformed. Uh, maybe it's the case that someone here is not a Christian. We urge you to want to obey the gospel today. We want you to believe on Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be baptized, and then you will be a transformed child of God. But maybe you're a child that's lost and you realize that you've been living in this world. We want you to come back home while together we stand and sing the song of encouragement. Will you come?